First Chronicles chapter 22, verses 6 through verse number 8. And the King James text today reads, Then he called for Solomon, his son. This is David, king of Israel. And charged him to build an house for the Lord God of Israel. And David said to Solomon, My son, I had it in my heart to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. But this word of the Lord came to me. You have shed much blood and have fought many wars. You are not to build a house for my name because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. Glory to God. Let's pray a moment. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Master, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I sense a wonderful, sweet anointing of the Holy Ghost upon the preacher today. And God, I couldn't be more grateful. When you laid this message on my heart, God, I knew it was an important message for so many in the church today. And I knew it was a powerful message, but Lord, somehow, some way, you've been preparing me this week and today for the delivery of this word. Oh God, I'm not even asking for the anointing. Oh, glory to God, I'm not even asking for the anointing because the anointing's here. Glory to God. But Master, I'm asking you to open hearts and minds. I'm asking you, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus to turn back every demon spirit from hell that would exalt itself above a, the higher knowledge of a living God. Every spirit of doubt, every spirit of unbelief, every spirit today, Lord, of rebellion, that would rebel against the word of the Lord. Master, in the name of Jesus, I bind it upon the authority of God's word and I cast it forth as dumb. Let every hearer, every hearer, have an ear, God, today to hear from the word of the Lord. Let every soul today, God, benefit from that which you would speak unto the church at this hour through your servant. Help me, Lord, to do your work, to fulfill my calling. Lord, to perform my obligation before you as a preacher of the gospel. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The theology found in the bulk of Christianity today is that of crime and punishment. You sin the sin, you pay the price. And the price is always the same. Hell, fire, and brimstone. Bless God, some people don't feel like they've been to church unless they've Heard the preacher preach in hell, fire, and brimstone. Grace plays a very little role in the life of believers, according to so many in the church today. Grace, according to them, is the medium whereby God first offers us salvation. But grace, according to them, is non-existent when we falter, when we fail, or when we fall. Ultimately, salvation is entirely upon us. Can we live a good enough life? Can we be perfect enough, sinless enough, godly enough, holy enough? 
Or do we forfeit our salvation by actions and deeds which fall short of the Lord's perfect blueprint for our lives? In our primary text today, we see that David lost the great honor and the privilege of building a house for the Lord. The Lord God of Israel. By reason of his warring and his tendency toward violence. Now notice, I'm going to tell you, I, I always preach things that other preachers are never going to say. And don't expect today to be any different. Notice the Lord said nothing of David's sexual appetites. Nothing of his womanizing. Nothing of his multitude of wives in spite of the fact that this would be the modern church's very first complaint if this man were in their pew. Mm -hmm. Oh, if this man were in the pew of First Baptist Church or First Assembly of God Church or First UPC, honey, they'd be too busy focused on his womanizing. They'd be too busy focused on him having a multitude of wives. They'd be too busy focused on his willingness to send a man to his death so that he then could take that man's wife and make her one of his own. He's already got dozens and dozens and dozens, but he still has to have this one. Everyone he sees, he's got an appetite for. He's got to have her. Isn't it funny that God didn't mention one thing about David's sexual appetites and his sexual conduct? Not one word concerning the building of his house God said, no, you shed too much blood. You're, you're a warring man. You're a man of violence. I'm going to tell you something. And I, I'm going to say it as plain as I can say it. And, and you holiness people can choke on your vomit for all I care. The church today is too stinking hung up on sex lives. It's too stinking hung up on human sexuality it is insane it is absurd it is ridiculous it is asinine it is foolish you will find in the word of god nowhere that god is so hung up on people's sexuality and their sexual conduct you you won't find if you study the word of god sincerely and honestly you will find that that is not one of God's greatest hang-ups. But it's the church's hang-ups. I'm going to tell you a little secret. If you want to know where it started, it started with Babylon being a phallic religion that was all about men's sexual organs, that was all about reproduction and, re and uh, reproduct uh, reproducing. Then the Roman Catholic Church came along as a revival of Babylon, and their entire focus from day one has been man's seed and where it goes, and it's all about reproduction. Just like Babylon, you moron! All this emphasis on where seed falls comes right out of ancient Babylonian religion because man's ability to procreate was <coughs> seen as one of his greatest divine purposes. And how many churches today call himself Protestant. They're no more Protestant than I am a black man. Call himself Protestant. They're not Protestant. They're daughters of the great whore of Babylon. They look just like mama. And they're all hung up with human sexuality. I'm going to tell you a little secret, people. 
Isn't it funny in the church, you never one time hear a sermon about those sexual issues that the Word of God does address, that the law of Moses did address. The law of Moses did address rape. Yes. The law of Moses did address incest. Uh -huh. The law of Moses did address child molestation. Right. The law of Moses did address prostitution. The law of Moses did address bestiality. But you won't hear one Pentecostal preacher in any pulpit anywhere talk about any one of those things today. Sir, well. I grew up in a church where there was a man who infamously was involved in an in incestuous relationship with his own daughter. It was known. People knew about it. Apparently she confided Tommy and friends of hers in the church, other girls, and they told their parents and what have you. And you know what? You never one time saw anybody in the church refuse to shake his hand. You never one time saw anybody in the church rebuke him. You never one time saw the preacher preach one message on incest and the damage it could do to your own child psychologically and spiritually. Never one time. Even though the law of Moses addressed such things. No, because we've got our ideas about which sexual issues God has hung up. i got news for you, stupid. He ain't hung up on none of them. The only sexual issues God has hung up on are those issues that involve force, that involve manipulation, and that bring hurt upon another party. Those are the sexual issues. God was not concerned with what the men of Sodom were wanting to do with the angels except for the fact that they were wanting to force themselves. They were wanting to force these angels, these men, to engage in their religious orgy. It had to do with rape. had nothing to do with whether it was male on male, female on male, or what. That wasn't the issue, stupid. I'm so sick and tired of stupidity. The law of Moses dealt with men of power and influence, people with resources, using those resources, that power, that influence, to exert themselves upon vulnerable people for sexual favors. We've got that going on every day. Mm-hmm. I know a man who was in the habit of every time he turned around, he's bringing some homeless young gay man into his home under the guise of helping him. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say it. Wasn't helping him. He was taking advantage of him. The poor kid's homeless, so you knew you could have your way with him because that was the only way that kid was going to have food in his belly and have a roof over his head. And I got news for you. If you think this preacher let that crap go on in our church and I wasn't going to say something about it, you don't know this preacher very well. That man knows exactly where I stand on such conduct. I have made it abundantly clear. It's wrong. It is sinful. It is ungodly. It is a shame. It is pitiful. It is disgusting. It is foolish. And it is not acceptable in the life of a believer. Amen. Try molesting a child in this church and see what kind of reaction you get from the pastor. Forget about me preaching from the pulpit. You'll have to peel me off of you because I will beat you within an inch of your life. Children are not sexual playthings. Don't let me catch you beating on your wife, mister, because I guarantee you I'll match every blow that you visit upon her and I'll match it on you because I don't play games. 
I've told people ever since I've been pestering, going back 30 some odd years, and I said, don't ever let me walk up on the, the doorstep of your house for a visit and hear you slapping your wife around, because sweetheart, that door will come flying off its hinges and I'll slap you every which way but Sunday. That foolishness will not, will not be permitted. But you know what, Tommy? You don't hear preachers talking about none of this. No, men in the church abuse their wives. Men in the church are as misogynist and as abusive as could possibly be. But you never one time hear a pastor bring these issues up. Oh no, he's too busy preaching against the homosexual. He's too busy preaching against adults who engage in intimacy between themselves and their conduct having got a thing in the blue ribbon to do with them or anybody in their church or anybody else. Define sexual sin any old way you want to. I could care less. You want to include homosexuality in amongst the, the list of, of fornication, acts of fornication. I don't care. Go ahead, list it. See if I care. My Bible tells me as plain as anybody can tell anybody anything that all sin is outside of the body. All sin affects somebody else. It involves somebody else. It has an impact on somebody else. But the Apostle Paul said, but fornication is the sin against one's own body. You know what, fool? Stay out of my bedroom. Stay out of my life. Stay out of my intimacy. It is none of your stinking business. Even if my Conduct fell under the category of fornication. It is a sin according to the word of God against my own body. Hadn't got a thing in the universe to do with you. So you can try to make it into a nation destroying thing. You can try to make it into a political issue. You can play games with it all you want to. But you are ignoring the word of God and playing games that you will one day answer to God in the judgment for. Because God is not as hung up on people's sex lives as the church is. Part of the problem, Tommy, is we got churches who have turned the Word of God into a legal document instead of a love letter. They ignore the value and the purpose of various books. If you remember when we did our study a while back, on Wednesday night I titled it Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you remember. And one of the first things that I did, I talked about the Word of God. I broke it down according to the uh, types of books that constitute the, what we call today the Bible, their purpose, their function. You had the five books of law. There are only five books of law. Let me repeat that. There are only five books of law in the entire Bible. Out of 66 books, five of them constitute Moses' law. Hmm. Then you have these other books that are called the books of wisdom. You have the Psalms, you have the Proverbs, you have the Song of Solomon. Books of wisdom. But you know what's funny? You know what's hysterical? The church will take a passage out of Psalms or a passage out of Proverbs and they'll turn it into a law. You're going to hell if you do this. Why Psalms says and Proverbs says thus and so. No. No. Even God approached his people in a much more practical, in a much more sensible way than the legalistic, pharisaical church does today. Now, there were books of wisdom. There was advice and counsel how to live your best life, how to have your best experience in this world. That's what Psalms and Proverbs are all about. It's not about edicts. It's not about demands. It's not about making up rules. You can't drink. You can't do this. You can't do that. No, it advises you stay away from fast women. Stay away from hard liquor. Do you know what I'm saying? Stay away. Abstain from drunkenness. But these are found where in the books of wisdom? It's not law. Didn't mean you'd go straight to hell if you got drunk. 
If that were the case, then why in the name of God did the Lord even bother saving Lot from Sodom when Lot was no sooner going to get out of Sodom than he was going to turn around and get drunk and have sex with two of his daughters, his own daughters. Oh, I'll tell you, but the church is so hung up, Tommy, on people's sex lives that it ain't even funny. Well, that's the biggest issue in the world. No, it's not. And you're an ignorant piece of meat if you think it is. The Lord said nothing of David's womanizing. He said nothing of his multitude of wives. That would have been the first thing pastors and churches and denominations today would have looked at when examining David's lives. Many believers will lose out on the blessings and the benefits and the favor of the Lord in their lives by indulging in their sin and their failings rather than finding a place of repentance and renewal. But believing that the fires of hell await us over every single failure or weakness in our lives is not only bad teaching, but it nullifies grace and gives place to the enemy who is forever trying to convince us to quit the race as after all we'll never measure up we'll never be able to do all that is necessary to make heaven our home but the price of every failing in our lives I'm going to say this and watch. So oh, some Pentecostal people man I'll tell you what they're going to you better put your diaper on lady Yeah, mister, you better grab your hair because you're going to have a fit when I say this because it don't matter if it's true or not. You don't care about truth. All you care about is holding on to the same old crap that's been preached for decades and centuries and eons. Truth matters little to most in the church today. But listen to me. The price of every failing is not hell. We must purge this fear-based belief system from our soul and embrace the truth. What is the truth? Listen, there is a price related to every sin, but what is that price? What's it going to cost me? Because David, the honor, the privilege of forever being associated with the grandiose temple of Jehovah God Almighty. David's name would never be associated with the building of the temple. No, that honor would go to his son, Solomon. Funny, Solomon was as big a womanizer as his dad. Solomon had more wives and more concubines than his dad. Oh, but the church is so hung up on sex. After all, from the beginning, God meant only for there to be one man and one woman. And that's how it's been for centuries. You're a liar and an idiot. You're a liar and an idiot. Can I say it any more plain than that? You are a liar and an idiot. That is not at all the way marriage has been approached through the centuries. And marriage today doesn't have jack squat to do with marriage 3,000 years ago. They're not even close to being similar in nature. Isn't it funny? Solomon was the biggest womanizer on the planet. Had more wives, more concubines than his dad David. But Solomon was given the honor of building a house for the Lord. David was not. Mm -hmm. David sinned. God didn't even look at his woman eyes. That wasn't even an issue for the Lord. What was an issue was his bloodthirst. What was an issue was his tendency toward war. David loved conflict. David loved to conquer. David loved to feel like a strong man. He loved to feel... Oh, I'm going to tell you, there are a lot of Christians in the world today. Tommy, they love to argue. They love to fight. Man, you give them an opportunity to stand up and fight, they're going to take it because they're bloodthirsty. Yet the word of God said, follow peace with all men 
and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. God ain't looking for you to be arguing and fighting with everybody. That doesn't please God. God's not interested in your arguing fact. Blessed are the peacemakers, not blessed are the war makers. Mm -hmm. Blessed are the peacemakers, not blessed are those who are willing to engage in conflict at every turn. They love to debate. They love to argue. Even though the Apostle Paul told us not to do these things. Because again, truth is of little consequence to these people. What's it going to cost me? Lord, I've got feelings in my life. I, I've got things in my life that, bless God, no matter how hard I try, I can't overcome them. I can't, I can't change them. I can't make it different. Lord knows I wish to God I could. I got a temper sometimes drive me up the wall. What's it going to cost me? It's going to cost me something. You can bet on that. Because it's a sin that would otherwise send me to hell? No. Because it's not God's perfect way of doing things. It's not, the way, it's not the way the Lord would like us to handle things. God wants us to walk in His will. God wants us to walk in His way. God wants us to follow His path and His leading and His direction. He wants us to have the best possible life. And the best possible life can only be had by a believer who is committed and sold out to doing it God's way. So what happens when, like David, we choose to pursue our own avenues and we pursue to indulge in our own little fantasies. We indulge in our own little failings. I like to war. I like to argue. I like to debate. I like to... And you think there isn't going to be a price for that? Got news for you, honey. You may not go to hell. You may make heaven. The Word of God talks about people making heaven by the skin of their teeth. The Word of God uses that phrase. We use the term the skin of the teeth. That literally comes from the Bible. There are going to be people that make it by the skin of their teeth. Well, if you can make it by the skin of your teeth, i got news for you. Um, all sin is not the same. Can't be. And it's not black and white. And it's not heaven or hell for every little thing you do, every little thing you say, every little feeling you have. Uh, it cannot possibly be. Because if that were the case, then people would be either getting in or not getting in, period. There'd be nobody getting in by the skin of their teeth. Am I telling the truth? Yes, yes. What will it cost me? David, it cost you the honor of forever having your name attached to the building of the temple. The temple is forever known today as Solomon's temple. Am I telling the truth? Yep. Why is this important? Why is it important that we understand that there is a price associated with every fault and every feeling. Every time we choose to go our own way and do things according to our own imagination rather than to do things the way God would have it done, every time there will be a price to pay. Why is it important to understand that that price is not always heaven or hell. Why is it important to understand today that there is a price? And if there is a price, what is that price? It's important because the majority, listen to me carefully, children. The majority of the price we pay for our failings and our sin and our faults, we will pay in this life. We will pay the price in the here and now. It's not all about in some distant future. It's not all about on judgment day. It's not all about will I make heaven or slip, uh, slip into hell. No. The price we pay for so many of our stubborn, rebellious actions, we pay in this life. 1 John 5, 16 through 18, the Apostle John writes, If any man see his brother sin a sin, 
listen, which is not unto death. Listen, those of you who have convinced yourself that everything is heaven or hell, that every little fault and every little failure is going to nullify the grace of God in your life and cause you to be lost for eternity. Listen to me! Said if you see your brother sin a sin, which is not unto death. My God, how much clearer can you make it? He shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Then John says in verse 18, continued, 16, I'm sorry. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. Verse 17, 1 John 5. All unrighteousness is sin. What is unrighteousness? Right. Not doing right. If God has ordained that you do things a certain way. If God has instructed us as his children to do things a certain way, and we choose out of rebellion, we choose out of ignorance, we choose for whatever reason to do those things our own way, pursue things our own way, we are acting unrighteously. We're not acting right. Right. And all sin... All unrighteousness is sin. Listen. And there is a sin not unto death. Again. There is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. What are you saying? John, you said if we say we have no sin, we make God a liar and the truth is not in us. And now you're saying we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Of course, of course we don't sin. Has nothing to do, has nothing to do with us, has to do with God. I can look at another person's kid, see them acting up. And then make me so aggravated, so mad, I want to go over there and beat that kid. You know, take a belt to his rear end till he learns to act right, like I used to have to deal with when I was a kid. Hello now. But let me adopt that kid and make him my own. All of a sudden, that's my child. It's not somebody else's kid, it's my child. And guess what? That kid can do the same exact things, and I don't see it the same way. I got news for you. When John said that God's people don't sin, he doesn't mean that we no longer are capable of sin, that we no longer uh, indulge in sin or commit sin. Right. He means everything changes when you become a child of God. Because God don't see your sin anymore. God don't see your failings like He used to. God don't know because your faith. Oh my Lord. The Bible said perfect love covers what? A multitude of sin. If God loves us like He says He loves us, then either His word is the biggest lie on the planet, or when he adopts us as his own, he no longer sees us as sinners. He may see us acting up. He may see us misbehaving. He may see us not doing right. He may see us conducting ourselves unrighteously. Hello now, children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he don't see sinners. Are you hearing me today? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Why, they don't preach that in my church, Pastor. Of course they don't. The rejection of God's will by the people of Israel in desiring a king over Israel cost the people of God dearly. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, we read the story of how the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel. And they said, Samuel, you're getting old. Your boys are misbehaving. They're not acting right. They're not as... 
godly as you are. They're not as righteous as you are. They don't conduct themselves with the same integrity that you do. Therefore, since you'll be passing from this life soon, we want a king like other nations have. Speak to the Lord. We want a king as other nations have. And Samuel wasn't happy to hear this because he knew that God's plan and God's purpose was to serve as Israel's king himself. Mm -hmm. There was thought to be a man that served as king over Israel. God himself was to be their king. He had the intermediaries, the judges, like Samuel, the prophets. Those served as his mouthpiece between he and the nation. But God had no desire for Israel to have a king other than himself. The saying displeased Samuel. Let's go to verse 7. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods and do so and uh, so do they also unto thee now therefore hearken unto their voice how be it yet protest solemnly unto them and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them and Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king and he said, there will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties and will set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries, to be cooks and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep and ye shall be his servants. Got news for you. You reject God's way of doing things. It's not heaven or hell, but there is a price to be paid. What am I going to, what's this going to cost me? What will it cost me? The Lord was telling them what it will cost them. He said, I want to be your king, but you've rejected me. You want a king like other nations have. Well, here's what it's going to cost you. But listen to this, Tommy, verse 18. And ye shall cry out in that day. Because of your king, which ye shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. What will it cost us? I'll tell you what it will cost you. You're going to get exactly what you want, but you don't realize when you get a king, you get somebody who is corruptible. You get somebody who wants everything for himself. You get somebody who wants to line his own pockets. You get somebody who wants to show favoritism to his friends. Hello now. All the things the Lord talked about, that's what he was talking about. He said, every good thing, the best of everything, that's what your king's going to want. He's going to do favors for his friends. He's going to take yours and give it to his friends. But what is part of that price? What will you pay? What will it cost me? 
You'll cry out in that day because of your king, which he shall have chosen you. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. That's what it'll cost you, Israel. Got news for you, children. There's a lot of people in the church today running around, acting like fools, being rebellious, being uh, 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 contrary, argumentative, debating with people, uh, constantly doing things contrary to the way that God would have it done. And then they wonder why they pray and their prayer hits the ceiling and bounces back to earth. Um, because there is a price to every sin. It's not always heaven or hell. No, the majority of the price we pay for our failings and our faults and our rebellion and our weakness, we pay in this life. Wonder why your prayer isn't heard? You wonder why God isn't giving you what you've been asking God for? In John chapter 9, verse Excuse me, John chapter 10, 9 through 11. God has promised benefits. He's promised blessings and favor to his people. John 10, 9 and, uh, through 11. I am the door, Jesus said. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. God has promised blessings and benefits and favor to his people, Tommy. Psalm 103, 1 through 5, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. There are benefits to living for God. There are benefits to doing things God's way. Isaiah 40, verse 31, But they that wait upon the Lord, meaning they that do the Lord's bidding, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. All oh, their blessings and benefits associated with doing things God's way. Proverbs 3, 1 through 12, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Listen. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes, Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the firstfruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as the Father the Son, in whom he delighteth. What will it cost me? 
God's promised an awful lot of blessing, an awful lot of benefit, an awful lot of favor to those who will do things His way. And I tell them the truth. Yes. Too many believers want to run around claiming the promises of God's Word and decrying unanswered prayer and unrealized blessings while ignoring the realities of their own walk with God. They never choose to look inward and carefully examine the way they live as children of the Most High. They certainly have no interest in hearing from the Lord on the matter, as did David. See, God didn't punish David. God didn't exact a price from David without letting David know why. Got news for you, children. You wonder why your prayers aren't being heard. You wonder why the blessing isn't coming to your life. You wonder why things aren't going your way. Uh, talk to the Lord and then shut up. And give God a chance to talk back. I'm going to tell you something. If He says something back you don't want to hear, something back you don't like to hear, chances are that's God. If you ain't never had God chastise you, if you ain't never had God correct you or rebuke you, then honey, you're not born again. I'm going to tell you, there have been too many times I've prayed about things and talked to the Lord about things, and the Lord had come back and say, um, this falls on you. Oops. I told you how I wanted you to handle this. I told you how I wanted you to do this. I told you how the best way to approach these things is. And you chose to do things your own way. Hello now. Now you're reaping what you've sown. Got news for you. God is not mocked whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap. It's not about God cursing us. It's about the simple fact that if we're not going to do things God's way, then we're not going to realize things that God has promised. Because God has promised things in direct correlation to our doing things His way. They that wait upon the Lord, they that do His bidding, shall renew their strength. Didn't say, they that believe on the Lord shall renew their strength. No, they that wait upon the Lord, they that do His bidding shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like his eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Got people running around and they're too tired and too sick to do the work of God. They're too tired and too sick to do the things that God has called them to do and they can't understand why. Um, talk to the Lord about it. David heard from the Lord as to why he wouldn't be allowed to build the temple. Got news for you, honey. The Lord will let you know why you're not being allowed. He'll let you know why you're not being blessed. He'll let you know why you're not experiencing divine favor. <coughs> Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. The ultimate loss of our soul is secured by the steadfastness of our faith. Keep the faith, let no man take thy crown. But while we yet live and breathe on this earth, always bear in mind that the blessings and favor of the Lord are directly tied to our conduct, listen to me, and our willingness to strive for a godly life, a life that reflects and resembles the life of our Lord while He walked this earth. God does not allow the misconduct of sinners among us to affect our blessing or our benefits. That is another lie that you hear preached in fear-mongering churches all over America and all over the world today. That is another lie from the pit of hell. You've got preachers out there who are demons, folks. I don't mean wolves in sheep's clothing. I mean they are demons in sheep's clothing. They're standing there working you up into a froth, working you up into a frenzy, making you angry, making you anxious, making you fearful, telling you that because of the sins of people in America, God is cursing in America, and all we're all experiencing that. You lying dog from hell. You lying dog from hell. No man pays the price for another man's sin. That's what the Word of God tells us. You paid the price for your own sin. 
when God was bringing judgment upon the earth and he was about to pour out a flood that was going to destroy all flesh, there was one man and one man's family that found favor in the sight of the Lord. Noah. Eight souls out of God only knows how many, but they found favor in the sight of the Lord. Why? Because God does not destroy the righteous with the wicked. Why do you think he led Lot and his wife and daughters out of Sodom? Why do you think he allowed Noah to survive the flood? Hello now, folks. Are you understanding what I'm talking about today? No, there are benefits and there are blessings to do it right. There are benefits and there are blessings and there's favor in living right and doing things the way God would have us to do them. And when we don't do those things, when we rebel against God and His way, it's going to cost you. There's an episode of sitcom on television Molly quits her job teaching school and winds up in a meeting with the authorities from the school and she's not quite sure yet whether she wants to go back to teaching or not. And there's a union representative sitting there with her and he told her, don't worry, I can get you off the hook. What happened, don't, it wasn't nothing. I can get you off the hook. Don't worry about it. And as she's sitting there listening to the union rep talk about her years of service and teaching, she realizes, I, I really don't want to do this anymore. I, I just can't do this anymore. I thought, you know, maybe I could go back to it, but I, I, that's, this isn't what I want to do. And she voices this. And the school board says, you realize, of course, that if you decide today to stop teaching, then you lose all your benefits. You no longer get a paycheck. She looks at the union representative and as only this woman can, she says, really? <laughs> well, of course. You think you're going to get paid? You think you're going to have benefits when you're no longer doing the job? Hello now. Got people that think they're going to get benefits. They think they're going to get paid. They think God's going to do for them as a child of God, even though they're living as Wicked is the world. And when I say wicked, I'm not talking about mor mor morality issues. I'm not talking about sexual issues. I'm not talking about... I'm talking about there is hateful, there is malicious, there is mean-spirited, there is argumentative. All the things that are contrary to godliness. They embrace all these things that are contrary to God. Oh, they'll quicker fight with somebody than they'll look at them. I talk about... Baking cakes for gay couples. Oh, they'll, they'll sooner, you know, start a war. They'll be happy to go to court and fight. Even though the Word of God said, Agree quickly with your adversary, lest he take you to court. Then they go to court and they lose, and then they really pitch a fit. The Word of God says, You will, stupid. So what do you think? The Word of God's full of lies? You think God is talking out of His hat for nothing? That the Lord just likes to hear His own voice? No. Should have just baked the cake, patted Him on the back, said, Enjoy it. I put my heart into every cake I bake. What they do with it and where they take it and what they use it to celebrate doesn't have jack squat to do with you. And if you think being argumentative and you think uh, starting a war over it is somehow going to set you up as righteous in the eyes of God, you are diluted. Mm -hmm. The full weight of God's full favor in our lives rests squarely upon us, blaming the ungodly among us. <laughs> oh, you're not blessed today. You're not experiencing blessing in your life because you've got a queer neighbor. You're not experiencing blessing in your life because drunkenness is rampant in America. You lying sack of dog. You lying sack of dog. No, you're not experiencing the full blessing and the full benefit of living for God because you're not doing things God's way. You're not living the way God would have you to live. You're being rebellious. You're fighting against the direction of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell you, you do things God's way, it never looks right. Never looks right. Never. Because God's way is so contrary to man's way 
Well, he just baked a cake for that couple. He didn't argue. He didn't stand up for holiness and righteousness. That's right, because he did it right. Hello now. He did it right. You do things God's way, God said, love them. He said, as much as this within you, do good unto all men. Hello now. Especially those who are of the household of faith. Uh, you do things God's way, most of the time it doesn't look right. But it is right. I want to tell you something. God's people do not pay a price for the sins of our neighbors. That is a lie from hell. Second Chronicles 7, 13 through 14. If I shut up heaven and there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people... Not the other guy. My people. Which are called by my name. Shall humble themselves and pray. And seek my face. And turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven. And will forgive their sin. And will heal their Land. You want to see God do something wonderful for America? Let the church repent. Let the church start Amen. doing right. Let God's people start turning to God and following after God's way and loving instead of criticizing and loving instead of judging and loving instead of condemning. Let God's people begin to act like Jesus. Let the church begin to be what the church is supposed to be. And God will heal the land, listen to me, for the sake of the church. See, the conduct of the unbeliever does not affect the outcome for the believer, but listen to me. <coughs> but the conduct of the believer can affect the outcome for the unbeliever. God's people act right. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then God's going to do things that affect everybody in a positive way. Then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and heal their land. Oh my goodness. I hope you're hearing me today, folks. This is an important message. You can make heaven having lived a miserable existence here on earth, the question is, why would you want to do that? Mm -hmm. Our God has created a way for us to become His children. And as His children to walk in His benefits, in His blessings, and with His favor. Healing and restoration are promised to the nation whose saints repent and strive to do right. What will it cost me? It cost Israel dearly. I'm going to tell you, there are too many people in the church today who want a king in America. They want a king. Oh, they're ready to crown old Donald Trump the most evil, ungodly, wicked, demonic, nasty, filthy, immoral human being that has ever walked planet Earth. A man worships at the foot of the almighty dollar. He'll sell out his nation in a minute if he thinks it'll enrich him and his family. Oh, but they want a king. You know why? Because God doesn't do things the way we think God ought to do things. God news for you. If God hadn't done it that way, there's a simple reason. It's because God don't work that way. Mm -hmm. What you think is the will of God for the nation is not the will of God for the nation. What the will of God for the nation is that the church act right, that the church behave, that the church live according to his teaching and his mandate and according to his instruction. That is the will of God. And if the church will do that, you'll be shocked to see and what happens to the land around us. You'll be shocked to see what happens in the nation around us. While you're so busy screaming and hollering and trying to get the sinner next door to you to act right, Right? You're acting the fool all by yourself. Yes. And you're forfeiting the blessing of God. You're forfeiting the favor of God. You're forfeiting the benefits of living as a child of God. 
cost. Every sin has its price. Every failing has its price. Everything is not heaven or hell. There is a sin not unto death. But consider today when you want to act the fool and you want to do things your own way and you want to rebel against God, what will it cost me? Mm -hmm.